Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode 556 of the Dead Robot Society. I'm Terry Mixon. Joining me, Paul E. Cooley. How you doing, man? <laughs> what? what is this? Every week, it's nothing but grumbly grouchy. Because this has been a very bad five days, that's why. So my Mac, Mac Mini from 2014 has been writing corrupted information to whatever drive I put it up to. So it's the USB bus. It's dead. Uh, the controllers are dying and everything else. So I have a new Mac Mini on the way. But uh, I have a shit ton of work to do for my iOS client. And uh, the robot thing is going crazy right now. So uh, I'm very busy on code and half my technology stack is dead. So... Yeah, it's you could always good. use, uh, you know, the Redamac thing. No, it won't. Uh, yeah, it would take me longer to actually upload the files to process than it would to download, <laughs> or you know, to wait for a new Mac to come. So yeah, good luck with that. Rent a Mac? Who the fuck are you? Anyway, uh, isn't that what it is? Where you're using the Mac in the cloud kind of thing? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I honestly don't know of any cloud providers out there for Mac. I've never looked into that. Um, there is a service where you can use a virtual Mac. That's what I'm talking about. Ugh. Ugh. So I, I honestly have no idea anything about it because I haven't used it. Oh, I can't imagine that would be quick for using Final Cut Pro. Ooh. I don't even... Well, that'd be bad. So anyway, uh, this episode is obviously going to be edited uh, on Linux, so we'll see how this goes. <laughs> <laughs> we may be missing some of our usual features because, well, um, yeah, I can't get to them. So, anyway, that's where things are with me. I'm still in tech support hell. We're in, what, week three of it? Week four? four. Week five? That's week four or five, maybe. Yeah. This Paul, has been a slow roll. Because Paul just finally realized what the problem is. And, yeah, we're correcting it. So, anyway. You know, for all of the technical issues I've had throughout the length of doing this podcast, I think you've managed to exceed them in a period of a month. Oh, I'm sure you're right about that. I'm sure you're right about that. But, you know, I've had to reinstall Mac OS twice. I've had to um, shuffle drives around, copy everything over. And while I could access those files for my Mac right now, because technically it still boots up, I don't want it touching anything. So that's where things are. Anyway, how are you? I've had a productive week. I've been writing. I've been editing. I think in the last six days I've written 12,000 words, so I'm happy with that. Yeah, that's nice. Wish I had. <laughs> so it comes yeah. and it goes. What can you say? Sometimes yeah. you, you you can write. Sometimes you can't. <sighs> I really want to fin finish this book. I have a long way to go though. So anyway, I guess I guess I know what I'll be doing on the flight if there is one. The the longer you write, the bigger the book gets. Oh, because the ending doesn't the ending doesn't get any closer. It just keeps stepping further away. <laughs> this is very true. This is very true. That's kind of how that works. It happens to me. I've, I'm in the middle of writing a uh, set of battle sequences, and it's taken me chapters longer than I thought to get where I should be in this, and that always happens. I know exactly what I want to do. It just takes longer to make it happen than I think it should when I start it. That's because we like to add too many complications. The sad thing here, I think, is I'm already 30,000 words into this novel. And so I'm in the middle of it, and they still haven't gotten away from the general area where they landed. They've still got 1,500 kilometers to go to get to their destination. Terry, this is too long. I of a don't know if it's going to happen. This is this too book. long of a truck stop book. You know, what the hell? They they went into Bubba's truck stop? Hey, they got showers. <laughs> it's just some long showers. Uh, what are they? You know what? Never mind. I'm going to let that go. I think, I think you should just let that I'll one go. let right it go now. rather than letting anybody's imagination go running off into the wilds with that one. But I'm, I'm being serious here when I say that I'm a third of the way into where I expect this novel to go. And I fully believe it will be at least another 10,000 words before I've settled the ruckus. Mm. So the journey really hasn't even started yet. 
This is I don't know that they're going to get where they're going. So let me get this straight. It took three books to get to Terra, and now that you're on Terra, it's taking them. It's going to take them three books just to do what they need to do on Terra. I'm starting to think that that's the case. Ah, oh, Terry. It, and I'm not the only one that's done this. I there was a series in the uh, Empire of Man universe written by John Ringo, where three big ass books were what it took to get them from crash landing on one planet back off that planet. <laughs> so I don't feel too bad about that. I, I just can't tell if you're procrastinating or not. It seems like the longer, the more experience I get with writing, the more time it takes to actually do anything because I'm no longer rushing through the battle stuff. I'm giving it the time that it needs to breathe. Hmm. Yeah, same here. The older I get, the, or the more experienced I get, the more time I want, I want to spend with the characters around the crazy that's going on with them. And I'm not going to make the mistake in this book of trying to rush it to the ending. I'm, I'm a discovery writer. They've met potential allies. We'll see where it goes from there. I doubt very seriously they're going to fully complete everything they need to do in this book. And that means at least one more. And I can see things that they may have to accomplish to make that happen. And if so, so be it. Let it be. Let it be. Let it be. Well, good on you. Keep us surprised, oh, travel guide to the characters. If I do this, though, I may have to, you know, next book, bring in, bring in some people off the planet to, to do some space stuff. That'd be a good diversion. All the point of view characters in this novel are on the planet. Hmm. So while I envision some things happening off the planet, I can't quite see how to make that work if I don't have a point of view character or two out. Gotcha. Okay. Fair enough. All right. With that said, we've got a guest today. We have a guest today. We do. Who is this? Because host? I want to talk about, well, writing multiple series. And uh -oh. I immediately thought of somebody I know that does that very well. So today, everybody, I'd like to go ahead and welcome Glenn Stewart on. The I hell are we babbling about? The hell are we babbling about? What, why did you interrupt this man's day to bring him on this show? I need a reason for that? Wait a minute. That's way too organized for me. <laughs> I understand this is normally the way things go, but I thought maybe we try and make the exception here. I actually did have something in mind to talk about. And Glenn, it's because Glenn does something different than just about everybody else I see in that he does a series set in a universe for a certain amount of books, whatever that may be, and then starts a new series and then starts a new series and then starts a new series, perhaps in the same universe, perhaps not. And that's different than just about everybody else and I think that's a good place to start talking. I don't do, I don't write, I mean, the one distinction between what I do and what you're describing is I don't write six books in a universe and then start another universe. So I write one book in a universe, and then a book in another universe, and then a book in another universe, and then I'll go back to the first one. Well, I'm, I'm like looking at what you've done with um, the Mage series. You, you've got a certain number of books that are going to be in the mainline series, and then they're going to stop. You've started another series with different characters that are going to proceed for a certain range and stop. It's yeah. You've got a, a, a start and an end point for a character arc in yeah. those novels. And unlike, say, somebody like David Weber, who has 30 some odd books or whatever in his one series, yeah. you right. actually yeah. bring things to a halt and start something new. Though I will admit that I am guilty in what the first five books that are the current, the, the original Starship's Mage series were a trilogy. You, you like trilogies. I can yeah, though I'll note that actually everything that has been written to date in Starship's Mage is inside the outline of the original trilogy. Hmm. So that, the original trilogy is stretched out a little bit beyond three books. 150,000 words, give or take worth at this point for the Starship's Mage. Uh, Red Falcon actually was not. Red Falcon would have been secondary. But everything from the, omnibus, the original Starship's Mage omnibus so Sword of Mars is the original outline for the original trilogy, which was 
Starship's Mage, Hand of Mars, Sword of Mars was the original trilogy. But yeah, I like trilogies. They're, I find they're a really um, nice length to tell a story, to tell a relatively long arc and wrap it up and move on to something else because I can't keep doing the same damn thing. <laughs> so that's your answer. I get bored. I want to write something new. Yeah, I can't write two books in the same universe consecutively. Really? You have, you really do have to take time off from that. I have to take a time off between you know, from a universe after I finish it for whatever reason. Or not, at least this works. This is the way it works best for me. So I'll finish a book in a universe and then I'll write another book in another universe. And because I am I have approximately the focus in terms of story of, I don't know, drunk skunk. <laughs> uh, That's longer than a squirrel, right? Just yeah, smellier? Yeah. Uh, I, I believe I peaked at seven at seven universes that I was working on simultaneously. And that, wow. was, that was right after Exile came out. I think I technically had seven active universes. That's a lot yeah. of things in the air. Right now, I think I'm down to three. Uh, Exile, Duchy of Terra, and Starship's Mage, I believe, are the three I currently have active. And, of course, I'm writing in the fourth one right now. Mm -hmm. And didn't you... Didn't I see a, a snippet of a new new universe? That would be the, the fourth universe. That would be Peacekeepers of Soul. My, uh, how did I phrase it? My happy-go-lucky, hippie, progressive utopia that committed genocide about three months before the book starts. Oopsie! <laughs> <laughs> oh, that, that's, that's, uh, that's depressing. <laughs> yeah, so Perhaps like going vegan was the wrong choice. <laughs> <laughs> it's my progressive socialist utopia that ended a war by exterminating the breeding case of the Yemen race. And that's not even a spoiler, because it literally is page one, chapter one, that this is my, that you have this being talked about in the past tense. Well, that's one way to end a war. <clears throat> yeah. Hunt down, and, hunt down and kill every single member of, this, of the op opposing species that can have kids. That will do it. Well... Maybe it'll do it because we've we've also seen things like Ender's Game where you didn't quite finish that extermination, or the um, the equivalent of the, the Krogan and Mass Effect. Though technically it's the Rachni and Mass Effect that I would be the, the it's closer to, where you know yeah they took out their they you know badly damaged their ability to reproduce, but over time they started finding ways around that. So the the plan is that somewhere along the lines there may that there will be at least attempts at a scientific solution or technological solution to the fact that this species had a bunch of queens and a bunch of drones and all the queens are dead. Hmm. Mm -hmm. And folks, in case you didn't realize it, we've wandered into the interview. <laughs> Basically, we've stumbled our way into the interview. So it's already in progress. Glenn, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself to those that don't know you already? Uh, I'm Glenn Stewart. I am the author of I Have Lost Count, science fiction and fantasy novels. I think it's 39, but I actually literally do not know. I could open a spreadsheet and check, but it doesn't really matter. The number is ridiculous to me, let alone anyone else. Uh, I have no official bestseller title tags. I have no letters. I've never ranked on USA Today or anything like that. And I outsell most people who do. That's so, good enough for, that's good. That's really, really matters, paying the bills. Yeah. I am one of the best-selling authors that will, that so that very few people seem to have ever heard of. I know it's weird <laughs> how that works, isn't it? Yeah, you know, I have to say I'm I'm very imp impressed by all that. But the fact that you worked with Terry Mixon on a on a couple books that just ruins well, everything. Well, he had to go through therapy, so I'm not sure that really counts. I've <laughs> lost all respect for you because you worked with him. I mean, it was a on. lapse in judgment. He's not going to let it happen again. <laughs> Let's be clear. That allowed me to get five books with two books worth of effort. Aha, uh -huh, I see. So Terry's slave labor, well, not slave right. labor, conscripted labor. Conscripted, uh, vault, yes. <laughs> so, I, mean, I write a 90,000 word novel normally. So, you know, five books. I put, uh, technically I got five books with like a book and a half worth of work then. Because I put 100, about 120, 130,000 words into the Vigilante of new words. Because there was an old book that we worked with to start with, but yeah, I only put about one hundred and thirty thousand new words into the Vigilante five and bound books. 
and then Terry. Terry was responsible for everything else. Oh, I, I while I can claim responsibility, I, I don't think I should. <laughs> <laughs> all the bad things are mine. All the good things are his. How about that? Oh, yeah. That makes a whole lot of sense. That makes a whole lot of sense. So for those of us who are insane and trying to juggle series, what 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 would you say the biggest lesson you have learned or how, how you've figured out how to cope with that? Take better notes. Oh my God. <laughs> oh my God. That is so true. I was actually going to ask you before Terry interrupted and actually started the interview. How dare him that, uh, um, how you were keeping track of all of that. Poorly. <laughs> that seems to be the universal answer that we keep uh, hearing over and over again. It varies from series to series. Um, Peacekeepers of Soul right now has, I think it's three, it might, yeah, three documents in there. One is my general, is the gen general setting file that I started with that includes a high level outline of the first book that I've already tossed out. I wrote another outline. It has vague similarities. <laughs> and as a bunch of, as much as anything, has a bunch of the, I sat down and sketched out exactly how the main ship worked in a lot of ways. Amusingly, one of the things I didn't actually sketch out when I did that was how it went between the stars. I worked out the FTL drive on, on a whim while writing the book, which is not how I'm supposed to do that. <laughs> <laughs> We're just going to make her go. Yeah, well, it's like I have this lengthy document detailing its weapon systems, its engines, its defenses, its power systems so on and so forth and nowhere in there did I actually even name its FTL drive. It's the redneck <laughs> drive. <laughs> right now. It runs on Lone Star beer. <laughs> that that is impressive. If you could but have yeah, a spaceship but... a starship running on Lone Star beer, I would be impressed. That so would how, probably be how... for someone more of a comedic bet than me, I suspect. <laughs> Maybe. So yeah. you have all that information about the ship. How much of it did you actually use in the books? Uh, so far, quite a bit. Uh, I mean, it's it, it's a more it's a little bit more hmm, hard. SF isn't quite the right word for it, but there's a there, there's a bit more detail and cognizance of the actual physics going on. Like it is one one of the ones where I'm actually tracking. I have a spreadsheet for what velocity are they at point A, what velocity are they at point B, has that effect the soul range. I don't always do that for all of my series. Uh, my ser each of my series is at a, kind of a different level of science hardness, especially around that particular set of rules, especially. But yeah, that one's got the, sh the ship, the star systems, and then a, a file on all of the um, the ranks and so forth of the United United Planet Space Force. And that's the files I have for there. And then Starship's Maze is actually a wiki. It's not anything resembling complete, but it exists. And one of the things that my team is feeding that from is my own notes on the universe, which are relatively detailed. I have been working on, I am 10 books in to the Starship's Maze universe. It seems like some of the universes I have the most detailed notes on, I've abandoned. <laughs> <laughs> I know how that works. For uh, now. You could come back. That's uh, I actually have some really broad and deep, some really deep and long notes on the Castle Federation universe. Like Peacekeepers, it was one that had that bit more heft to some of the back background calculations. Uh, I found that didn't necessarily... Some of my audience really likes that, and some of my audience doesn't. So it's kind of something I have to go back on overall. Peacekeepers, I'm trying for a different level of balance that includes a bit more of that than I have had in, say, Duchy of Terror, where I literally threw the laws of physics out in the first three chapters explicitly. Yep. Isn't it nice to do that? <laughs> but by the the laws of physics. Yeah, we know. Carry on. <laughs> we don't care. In this universe, that doesn't apply. Now, now, now we return to our story. <laughs> exactly. In, inside the Duchy universe, you've got a lot of scope that you could have background on because... Yeah. You've got all kinds of, of galactic civilizations, some of which are far older than yep. humanity or even the people humanity is associating with. And there's lots of things going on in that universe where oh, yeah. when you're done with whatever story arc you're doing now, you can go, yep, I can just pick up and go over here. 
That is pretty much exactly what I'm doing next with the Duchy of Terror universe. Uh, originally, the book, the next book, the book's coming out in September, I think, uh, Imperium Defiant, was intended to be the last one. But I am now writing a new, I, have, I now have a new trilogy uh, on my schedule for that universe. So. I'm actually pleased to hear that because I, I, I hope it's exploring more of of the the gone and defunct civilization <laughs> and species, because yeah. that's a very interesting topic for me personally. You'll like Imperium Defiant. Yay! And you'll like the next trilogy. <laughs> exploring those type of situations with dead civilizations, particularly ones that that bring about their own end through well, stupidity. Yeah, yeah but... I can't really talk. <laughs> It's hard to say what happened to the precursors of Duchy of Terror without it being a huge, blatant spoiler for half the series at this point. So, Yep, so I'm avoiding the details, but yeah. finding out the details behind that's going to be interesting. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Is that a, I don't know how the hell you're going to pull this off interesting, or you're just looking forward to how he figures out how to oh, do it? Oh, I'm looking forward to it. I, I, I have my suspicions about some parts of it. That, is a David Weber quote. Tum, 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 tum. <laughs> <laughs> or as Mr. Burns would say, excellent. Yeah, exactly. So Terry's fanboying, that's just terrible. I've always been a Glenn fanboy. Ever since I chanced across his, his first novellas with um, Starship's Mage, I thought it was amazing, and I've devoured just about everything he's put out. For some reason, I haven't gone beyond the first Castle Federation book. I've, I've really got to go back and read it. I didn't stop reading it because I didn't like it. I think I got sidetracked. You always get sidetracked. I've, you should see how many books I have on Audible. It's horrible. I know how many books you have on Audible, and I know it's horrible. I think you could walk 24 hours a day, 365, and still not end your list. I think this is true, and at the rate I keep adding books to it, I'm in no danger of that happening. I believe Terry is clearly counterbalancing me. <laughs> How was that? I have no books in Audible. Uh, I have the only, literally, the only time I have listened to an audio book is Tantor used to send me CDs of the books I did with them, and we listened to most of the original Starship's Mage in the car driving to Boston, I think it was. Is listening to your own work kind of odd? It always yeah. is for me because then I want to get critical. Yeah, uh, the, listen, the trip to Boston was when I realized that uh, Kelly Lamont's hair in Starship's Mage doesn't stay the same color. <laughs> Which then from the accident in the original novellas became a defining character trait of the woman going forward every time she showed up. And yet it wasn't there in the first book. Yeah. Mm. Whoops. In the first book, it was a mistake because she went from blonde to brunette to redhead. <laughs> you know, as consistency errors goes, that's pretty minor. It, no one, I don't think anyone even noticed it except me when I was listening to it. <laughs> I've, I have renamed planets. I've renamed starships. I've dropped important plot points that I think are important. And nobody has ever noticed. I've killed characters twice. People <laughs> oh, noticed that one. <laughs> I still think my favorite, absolute favorite in terms of typos and errors is the one that made it all the way into the hardcover of one of David Weber's books. The bridge was at the center of ass of the ship. <laughs> <laughs> Spellcheck didn't catch that one. Neither did, you know, five rounds of proofreading copy edits. <laughs> yeah. Robert makes it past, like, I think I'm at about that five rounds of proofreading and copy edits at this point and stuff still makes it through so if you're anything like me at this point i used to be paranoid about any mistake whatsoever now i'm like yep that got through okay we'll fix it later la yeah, la, la, la 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 some but it's one of the big things that people tend to level against because like i my current my experience is a lot of people when they see that it's a not from one of the big five even i wouldn't even say it's independent publishers but it's not from one of the big big publishers they recognize they're going and looking for typos and errors expecting it to be an inferior product and, they, and so you end up getting reviews bitching about it i don't anymore and that makes me very very happy <laughs> i'm not sure well, what i get for reviews i look at the overall star number i don't actually read any of the individual reviews i let my wife <laughs> but i still read my reviews 
I, mean, I just read all the reviews that came out today for Refuge. But I mean, when I'm 15 reviews deep and they're all five stars, that's generally safe to read. Yeah, I look at the numbers when a new release comes, I go, ah, oh, thank goodness, not, not a whole bunch of one stars. I think I'm going to live. <laughs> live until the next book. Live until, every book is a new one where you launch it and you go, it's like Mork with the egg. Fly, be free. <laughs> you hope that it doesn't do that. Yeah. A little bit like the flattering would be good, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I did launch a book today. <laughs> oh, no. Something just hopped by your window. I'm not sure what it was. It could have been a bunny. I am unsure. Uh, I'm going to guess bunny. There's a couple bunnies that hang around out here. They're not <laughs> usually on the deck. They're not usually on the deck behind me, but. I don't know. <laughs> no, like I'm watching. I like have this tiny little uh, thing of me. Well, don't worry. It could be worse. At any moment, there's going to be a cat perched on Terry's shoulder oh, on oh, top yeah. of his head. That's just the way it happens. Minimum one, you know. What's, ter what's Terry's maximum cat capacity on shoulders? I'm going to go with four, maybe five. In the mm -hmm. office? Sure. <laughs> yeah, in the office. In the no, office, say maximum cats in his house, maximum cats with fit on his shoulders. Ooh, yeah, I'm gonna go with two because as soon as there's two, they're gonna start swatting at each other, and my head will be in the middle, so that will not last long. <laughs> Terry, Terry has a very dysfunctional family. <laughs> what can I tell you? The pounce is near itself. Two, two humans and 23 cats. That's dysfunctional by any standard, I guess. Yeah, I can agree with that. How not many... that I actually have 23 cats. <laughs> It just feels that way sometimes. <laughs> Glenn, I'm, I'm, I'm curious. Do you have any standalone novels? I have. Well, I had until yesterday, to, until today, I had a standalone space. <laughs> uh, Exile was originally written as a standalone. It now has a sequel. Sorry. Uh, I have two standalone fantasy novels. Um, one was written as a standalone. One was intended to be the start of a series, but never caught, never, never sold well enough to justify it. Gotcha. So you had planned that around there, but you put it out, and since there was not much interest, you decided to not start the series, so to speak. Yeah, so the first book was rated to stand well enough on its own, but wasn't intended to lead into a series. It didn't happen. No, it, I mean, it's been out for six years, I think, maybe five years, and has only ticked over 10,000 sales. Yep, it's a bunny. It's jumping up and looking in your window. So it is. There is a bush rabbit outside my window. He's jumping up and down and looking through your window. <laughs> I, apparently, we have an extra guest today. That's perfectly cool. I've I've had two novels that I intended to be a series that they didn't perform well, so they're not getting any sequels. Yeah. Maybe one of these days I'll come back to the post-apocalyptic one because I enjoyed writing it, and I think that my terrible cover probably contributed to it not selling well yeah my parents liked that one yeah. i enjoyed writing it i think it's a good story it's but, i really should give it a couple more novels to see what it does but i'm not going to do that till i till i have time in the rest of my schedule yeah, and i'm going to hire somebody that does that type of cover work because unlike science fiction i'm not quite sure that my wife and i have a good grasp on how those covers work for that yeah. well i mean my general opinion at this point is I wouldn't, funny as this sounds, since I target books and trilogies, I wouldn't actually start a series without planning to at least write three books at this point. I would space, the, I mean, I'll space them out over a period of time, like a year is the minimum. I think I can release three, I'd release three books in a single series across this point. But I wouldn't want to start a series without planning at least three and probably, probably two books at least to see what happens. Um, Exile honestly didn't actually sell well enough to justify sequel, but it was all online sort of thing, so went out and wrote the sequel anyway. Publishers Weekly loved Exile, Publishers Weekly hated Refuge. <laughs> Which probably means that Refuge is going to sell a lot better. Probably. I mean, <laughs> Exile was intentionally written. Exile was written to be a somewhat more literary SF book than I traditionally write. It was written to be to have uh, someone heavier in terms of themes and so forth than I have been writing before. Refuge continues that, but has even an even higher quotient of explosions than Exile. So <laughs> more explosions, good. I think the Publishers Weekly reviewer got distracted from the actual 
they said, you know, too many expl the, the story was given, was, how is it phrased? Character relations were foregone in favor of a deluge of space battles. And I'm like, there were a lot of character relationships in there. Like, did you miss them? Did you miss the aliens? Did you miss the... Apparently, all right. Uh, apparently, you got distracted by the boom boom. I've, I've discovered over the years that reviewers and my opinions don't usually match. Yeah. If reviewers hate something and the audience likes it, I know that I'm going to love it. And it's almost yeah. always true. Yeah. And I mean, nothing against Publishers Weekly. They got exiled to a degree and uh, they grokked it in a way that a lot of people didn't. So I can't really complain too badly that they didn't, that they got distracted by the explosions in Refuge. And I mean, at least I got a Publishers Weekly review both times. It's more than a lot of people can say these days. Yeah, that's true. That is very, very true. So the, the one that you're working on now, you're starting off with three months earlier having committed an act of genocide. That's... That's quite an audacious beginning to a novel. It start. It literally starts with the main character's PTSD nightmare over giving that word. Yep, I see it. And, and it's and it's and it's interesting because he's at the end of his therapy at that point, so he can step back a bit from the dream and he can literally go, "No, no, no, no! My intelligence officer wasn't telling me this is the last one when we actually pulled the trigger because when we pulled the trigger, we didn't know. <laughs> we didn't find out until three weeks later." That we were the ones that actually killed the last queen. Hmm. Yeah, I could see how that might mess somebody up. Starting a character off with that type of trauma is going to lead to interesting places, I would imagine. But, well, I mean, literally, the book starts with uh, Colonel Henry Wong in therapy. It's his last day of therapy before he's returned to active duty, but it starts with him still technically on, me on uh, medical leave as a psychological casualty. Oh, it can only get better from there. Exactly. <laughs> Only five thousand words in, and I think he's only killed about eight hundred people so far. It's <laughs> the drop in the bucket. Barely worth a footnote. I get the feeling he has higher body counts in his books than I do. <laughs> Imperium defiant the body count in active uniformed military personnel or equivalent thereof is probably somewhere in the eight figures. <laughs> That's a lot of people. And that's just straight up people in uniform serving on Navy warships. I don't know, Terry. Suddenly I'm not real. I'm not real. I'm not real enthusiastic about the idea of enlisting in his armed forces. What do you think? That's okay. It's I don't think you should. I don't think you should have lived in the Terran empire in my uh, past history either, because I exterminated trillions. So yeah, there's that. I mean, you just don't sign up for the uh, battles that are going to involve 1500 capital ships on the side. The casualty rates for those tend to be uh, impressive. A lot of your your stories come with really different themes in them. Do you, is it just do you come up with your ideas for a new series? Is it just it it comes to you out of other things, or do you do you try to like brainstorm where to go with a new series? <laughs> they won't stop. They won't go away. <laughs> <laughs> The buddy <laughs> behind me in the window is pretty uh, exemplary of how my plots come into play. I have a field of bunnies, and they keep fucking and making more bunnies. <laughs> All right, there's your bumper for the beginning of the show. Oh, my God. <laughs> no kidding. So, uh, I am working on, like, I'm working on a new series right now. Uh, I think not the book after this is the XF, the Refuge sequel. And I believe the book after that is actually another new series. Another one? Yeah. I don't even know if I could count how many series you have at this point, at much less point, books. Fuck if I um, um, At that point, I will be with it. Because Crusade will end the Exile trilogy, and I'll be done with that universe, at least for the moment. And then Conviction starts a new universe and a new series. So at that point, I will have Starship's Mage, Duchy of Terra, Peacekeepers of Soul, and uh, Shattered Stars. I wasn't just referring to active series. Oh, I'm saying I think I've lost track of how many series there's been from beginning to end. Uh, yeah, probably. Why What's the difference that? between a series and a trilogy? Uh, to me, I would say a series would be... Well, a series is something that's intended to be more than three books. Okay, So what happens? Uh, what do you call it when a trilogy just won't stop? <laughs> that becomes a series. Yeah. <laughs> 
you end up stretching it to five be, books. Like, I would not have actually admitted in public that it was that Exile was planned to be a trilogy, except that one of my uh, our ops manager carried on and did that for me. So, <laughs> whoops. <laughs> <laughs> hey, look, the third book of the Exile, the second book of the Exile trilogy is coming out. Oh, shit. Oh, well, I guess it's going to be a trilogy now. Got to stop with one more book. Uh, but yeah, I would say generally the distinction I actually draw isn't so much between series and trilogy, it is between universe and series. Okay, gotcha. So Starship's Mage and Starship's Mage Red Falcon are both in the Starship's Mage universe, but they are different series. Technically, uh, Duchy of Terra and uh, Light of Terra are two separate series, though they do lead on sufficiently from you know, Light of Terra does lead on sufficiently from Duchy of Terra that I will become calling them the same series, but certainly they're both in the Duchy of Terra universe. Um, with Shat one of the things I'm planning on playing with with Shattered Stars is setting up a universe in which I can write a bunch of different stories in different locations around the universe, sharing similar rules around society and timelines and technology. But so that would be the Shattered Stars universe, and then Conviction is book one of the Conviction trilogy, because they're all stuck on one poor bad one poor battered carrier that's on its fourth owner, and is on the back end of nowhere. <laughs> and I'm sure yeah. nothing will happen. It'll be yeah, just nothing fine. bad. Nothing it, bad will it happen. Was a wonderfully competent second-rate ship for a second rate power when she was built 150 years ago. <laughs> now she's the uh, second, the, the only ship of a fourth rate mercenary company bumming around the back end of nowhere. <laughs> yeah, I'm thinking I don't want to serve on that one either. <laughs> Bucket of bolts. <laughs> yeah, the cover, I believe the cover brief for that one was I want the, the carrier to be very clearly kind of falling apart and the starfighter to be very shiny and the one starfighter you can see on the deck to be very shiny and chrome. You've got, the, the ship. you've got the shiny chrome starfighter and it's all set to go, but it won't go. And you've got a mechanic up there with a big wrench going, wong, 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 darn <laughs> rail stuck again. Yeah, basically the concept of the cover art and the good chunk of the story revolves around that starfighter doesn't belong on that carrier. How did it get there? Yeah. Oh, okay. it get there? It's to stolen. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just trying to imagine this 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 large capital ship out there where it's not one color. It's completely every deck plate was just oh God. haphazardly repaired with the space version of Bondo and Gorilla Glue. You're talking about the first vehicle I ever owned right there. <laughs> when was I was it in a high gremlin, school, Harry, did you no, own a gremlin? It was a pickup truck. But the way it was a pickup truck was very unique. It was a pickup truck where the back half of it was 1960s. The front half of it was 1970s. The back half was a horrible green. The front half was tan. Someone had cut out the center of the hood and put a canary yellow hood scoop inside. They'd ripped out the seats and bolted down bucket seats to the floor on top of cut two by fours except that they, at least the passenger side, was only bolted on the outside, and the door would open if you turn too sharply, as my best friend found when I turned a corner and his door popped open and the seat tried to dump him out. Oh! Take that truck and stick a 2018 supercomputerized engine in it, and you're basically at what conviction ends up being. <laughs> <laughs> a souped-up pile of junk. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, the thing about conviction is the carrier is a pile of junk. For a sort of reason, the starfighters they're flying aren't. <laughs> the starfighter is actually the one powering the ship. <laughs> oh my god, they're having to get out and push. Oh, that would be so goddamn funny. <laughs> I just wrote a sequence where a group of starfighters hooked up tow cables to a crippled starship and hauled it. Yep. I mean, the, the starship in question was crippled because the starfighters in question just nuked it. Oh, what like pirates do, do, right? The <laughs> fusion <laughs> plant is down. What are we going to do? Run a cable from the Starfighter and we'll see if we can jump it. <laughs> <laughs> right now. We've got some banana pills to fuel the nuclear reactor. <laughs> yeah, it all sounds like it's going to you know, work there's, out there's just all fine. kind of shticks you could do that fit along in that yeah. particular theme. 
I plan on having a bit of fun with it because I mean a lot of my stories are written far more on for whatever reason I kind of had a few of my universes get away with me quite badly and I've been writing fleet battles and just fleet battles for a while so <laughs> I want to get back to some small scale single ship uh, one ca you know one carrier and a dozen and a dozen hot rod fighters in the middle of nowhere uh, one battle cruiser running around trying to do, keep the peace on a hundred systems yeah that sounds like a much better uh, uh setting for getting to know interesting characters and having That's fun part of it, yeah it. david Wibber did something similar to that with one of his side series in the honor harrington universe where he I said just one doing. little ship out there to do business in yeah. an area and then lost track of what he was doing and, had, and ended up writing fleet battles in that set series. <laughs> i got a little upset with that one <laughs> shadow of dragon Annie was a fantastic return to form and then the rest of the series went back to the same stuff he'd been writing everywhere else. I can agree with that. Don't, don't that is my that. alarm telling me I'm supposed to be on this podcast in 10 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> don't miss it because, you know, you wouldn't want to be late. <laughs> well, it's not like you guys ever actually sent me the calendar invite. Oh, Terry. Actually, wow. that was you, Paul. What are you talking about? You're the one with control over the calendar. I told you to send a note. You failed. Here's the wet noodle. Schmack, schmack, schmack. You know, he's the booker. That's it's right. I'm the booker. Book. You're the calendar guy. Come on. Come on. He has access to the calendar. He's just a lazy fuck who wants me to do all his work for him. Well, sure. Who wouldn't? <laughs> Did I say that out loud? <laughs> I, got through, I got through five novels being a lazy bastard who expected Terry to do the work for me. So. <laughs> it, it mostly worked sometimes. God. So he, he's got to keep track though because if he lets me go a couple of chapters without watching what i'm doing there's no telling where i'm going and on one notable occasion he repeated a sequence from earlier in the book i swear to god <laughs> i i thought that i totally thought that was something you'd said we were going to do i'd forgotten it was already done so <laughs> yeah there's sometimes being old is a bad thing god. hey i was able to save it oh, i'm sure you were I'm sure you were just slight miscommunication or yeah. You didn't take her Jared. It's kind of like such a great you? idea. What I thought of it. <laughs> Cause it already been done. Right. Gotcha. So let me ask you, Glenn, how do you tame the bunnies? Uh, I write, I take note. I basically, there's a bunch of files on my computer. There's a folder on my computer. that's called blue sky stories. And what will happen is I'll sit down. When something gets really stuck in my head, I'll sit down and I'll dash out between a uh, thousand and three thousand words of just outline, setting, summary, that sort of thing. And I'll save it in there and I'll go away. And that gets it out of my head for the moment. It's enough for me to kind of bring back everything that didn't get written down later on. And that's where like um, Raven's Peace, Peacekeepers of Soul, I think I originally wrote the setting summary sometime last year. I couldn't tell you when. Um, Conviction, I wrote the setting summary like February of this year. There's a 5,000 more dark fantasy steampunk trilogy outline in there that I would love to write. I don't know if I'll ever get to it. If I do, it'll be in like 2021. Um, the, I I've got a superhero story that, that I wrote 10,000 words of that I'm going to screw up eventually because I just lost interest. Fortunately, no, I don't think anyone actually wants to see me write superheroes. But yeah, so I note them down, and then I kind of look at my calendar and see, okay, where I, when do I need a new series, a new book? And when do I not already have something slotted in? And go, okay, and I, unfortunately, with the way we're scheduling things right now, I kind of need to make those calls like about a year in advance. So I know at this point my entire 2020 writing schedule. And we have covers, I believe we have covers on order through a the July of 2020. Wow. He's a lot more proactive than I am. <laughs> Prolific. No, I meant proactive. I still oh. don't know what I'm going to, I, I use the right word here. I don't know what books are coming after the one that I'm writing. I, I think I may know the next one. Every time I write a schedule, by the time I get to where I'm finished with the book, I just rearrange everything. So it's, I might as well stop. The schedule flexes, but not as much as you might think. Um, 
I think Mountain of Mars was originally scheduled for June of next year, and I've moved it up a bit. I don't remember when I moved it up to off the top of my head, but it has moved up so that people will finally leave, so I can finally say, yes, David Montgomery's story is done. Leave me the fuck alone. <laughs> it's such a curse when your fans hound you for a book. Oh, I know. I know. And I mean, it's not like David Montgomery is going away after Mountain of Mars. He's just no longer... He's just no longer going to be in a place where he can really be the core viewpoint character of a book. I am not going to set up the situation where my viewpoint character for the series is Fleet Admiral and can't leave the home system without really <laughs> yeah, without be a, problem. A, a, a battle fleet of 10 million ships or something. <coughs> David, let... <coughs> yeah, that's okay. I have a crown princess long. running around and I'm going to keep her running around for a while longer. But, you know, you can't have the emperor running around. I can't have the emperor running around now. That would be awkward. Yeah. So, you know, once I start doing terrible things to Damien, once I start doing the worst things I could possibly imagine to Damien and making him responsible for shit, he kind of gets stra strapped down a bit and I need someone else to run around and get in the middle of trouble. Yeah. I, I understand what you're, I understand where you're going with that. Yeah. And I've been kind of introducing and phasing in the girl I'll be doing that with, Saint Sailing and Arcana. So she's been in four books now, I think. Makes some people grumpy, but I want to have some continuity when I continue when I move to the next the next mainline series in the universe. And um, this is kind of an aside. And just like the Exile Universe, not the Exile, the uh, Terra, Duchy of Terra Universe. You've got the the dead, defunct aliens inside mm -hmm. Starship's Mage that one of these days I hope you, you even though you've mentioned something about them, I do hope you dig back into the art, the whole background of them further <laughs> going on. Cause I do love that shit. Yeah. I imagine a lot of people do. Uh, a lot of people seem very confused by the fact that I went and finished the plot I'd originally started rather than continuing to follow the uh, trail of the aliens. Like a lot of people are like, why are we going off on this side mystery that was, you know, the core plot of the first book? <laughs> well, you you're basically there. introduced ancient aliens and and the yeah, guy with the here, hair showed this, up, and now they just want to go that way. Here's this yeah. awesome Ferris wheel. It's the best Ferris wheel of all time. We're not going on it. <laughs> <laughs> so they don't seem to understand, or they don't realize yet that everything is linked. Yeah. And, yeah, yeah. But at the same token, what they're saying, you know. You went off and solved this side mystery. I'm like, no, that side mystery was kind of the <laughs> core plot that the series has been building to since book one. The stuff you're talking about is relevant and is going to be continued on is not involved with this side mystery. But <laughs> It's like when I was a uh, game master for many years, you'd build this grand adventure for the players to play in, and then they'd find something that you never even considered and just go herring off in their own direction. Yeah. And you'd be like, but but this thing, this thing I've got over here. No, nope, that's not how it works. That's not what what you think is shiny is not necessarily what they're what they think is going to be. And I mean, so true. A lot with regards to reviews, and uh, this is as much telling it to myself as anything else. No reader's interaction with the book is wrong for them. True. Truth. Like they may read the book and it may, and they may have actually wanted something completely different than you wrote, and hate what you wrote because you didn't do what they wanted with the characters. But their experience, and I may roll my eyes at that concept a lot, but their experience with the book is still not wrong for that. Yeah, that's, I mean, there are good writers whose work I just don't read because I don't like their writing style. I know they can tell good stories, but I don't necessarily like their writing style. The same uh, thing with directors and movies, same thing with actors and movies. I have watched about 16 episodes of The Expanse with my wife the last few weeks, and we stopped because we were done. There were a whole bunch of reasons as to why we were done. None of them are that The Expanse is a bad show. It's just that we, there was some, we lost interest. We weren't willing to continue with certain aspects of the show that we found less than, less than enjoyable. So we stopped watching it. It just got a fifth season. I'm pretty sure it's a good show. <laughs> Weirdly, we were talking about The Expanse in the pre-show right before you came on. And I stopped somewhere probably half the distance she went in for reasons of my own, not because I, I disliked it, just I lost interest. Yeah. Uh, I know I stopped the books because of the body horror aspect. The body what? The horror. body horror aspect. I'm sorry, yeah, I it glitched. I did not understand what you said. 
Um, so the body horror aspect. Uh, body horror. Okay, uh, got the it. The sort of molecule was basically eating people. And it was just like, I did not like that. It really kind of grossed me out. So I stopped reading the book. <laughs> I made it past that point on the TV show and ran into other aspects that I found even less enjoyable. <laughs> so uh, we go and we'll find and we'll find something else to watch. And Weirdly, we that was what Paul was talking about was the horror aspects. And I was going, what horror aspects? <laughs> yeah. I, was, I, stopped, I stopped before that happened. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, that, one of my friends actually the uh, found the proto loves the loved the expanse until the proto molecule showed up, and as soon as the blue shiny space magic became a fact from the TV series, he lost all interest and got uh, kind of angry about it. <laughs> like, but they had this great realistic sci-fi thing, and then they did what? With it? Well, they still have it. It's that way for the humans. It's just the universe has gotten bigger than yep. what they understood. That's all it is. Yep. So yeah, I, I read through th through book three and stopped. Yeah, that's two more so, books and a lot more and about three more TV seasons than I get engaged with. So. Yeah, it, it's it's interesting. I'm interested to see where they're going to go with it, but it's almost like the first three books were just a prequel to where the series is actually going. I don't mm -hmm. know. I could be wrong. I could so, be wrong. That's always risky. What was the series that I recommended to you and that, that I've now totally forgotten that uh, you read the books and it wasn't anything like what the story was? Um, it was with the uh, sleeves, the people that could move their bodies. Oh, altered carbon. Altered carbon. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That, I was going to suggest that might be one that you might like because it, it had some elements that were similar to uh, what was going on in the expanse, but the story for the first season just went through it was amazing the entire way through. I yeah. frankly, I think our, we did just as good a job in Vigilante of the you know in Soul the space adventure stuff, and we didn't have space magic. <laughs> <laughs> so it's oh, the guy yeah. who's got a series oh, yeah. called Starship's Mage. All right, I, I, <laughs> there's a problem here. There's a problem here. I like my space magic and my. Space see, magic. Want to see, there's the problem. You just made that statement, and then it's like, wait a minute. <laughs> what did you just say? I have multiple series of that space magic, and at least one with. So what you're telling me is the Expanse suddenly shattered expectations because they hadn't set that up at the very beginning. I think for a lot of people, that's my impression, is because the tone of the series and the book, too, is this very hard, um, near future is not the wrong word, but not the right word, but this very hard um relatively low tech sci-fi inside the solar system and i think for a lot of people the proto molecule stuff and it's breaking the laws of physics and so on and so forth very much felt like it came out of nowhere hmm. and i mean coming out of nowhere is a thing with science fiction right now where the twist has to be unpredictable and unforeseen and i hate that with a burning passion i mean a lot of people thought that the twist at the end of uh, bound by honor kind of came out of nowhere or the the last, second last book that Terry and I wrote together. And I, if you look for it, that relate that blood relationship that triggers that is sprinkled throughout from book one. Yeah, I drop hints. I dropped a lot of hints and had to build up a lot of stuff for the first book of Derelict Saga. And I wasn't going to play with it for two more books, yeah. but it had to be there because I needed people to know that was there. Yeah. And then we start playing with it. Is, um, so there's a big twist in Sword of Mars. And a lot, a lot of people, like I intend, I foreshadowed that quite early on in the series because I always knew it was coming. And a lot of people felt that it was too obvious, and I actually got reamed in reviews and actually in some personal messages I got from people as well that it was the book just wasn't clever enough because it was too uh, predictable. Um, <laughs> like I, the book, just because you can't, you saw the twist coming, like you're supposed to see the twist coming. There's supposed to be a chance there. For you to see the twist coming. Otherwise, I'm not playing fair with you. True. But uh, there's a certain style of writing in sci-fi these days where you shouldn't, where you're not supposed to see the twist coming, and the author doesn't play fair with the reader. And I don't like that as a style of writing, I guess. One of the things that I do as a pantser is I'm not gonna know what twists that I'm gonna get to later on in the novel, most likely. Mm -hmm. And I'll drop things that I can use for those twists. Yeah. Some of the foreshadowing may be used. Some of it may never be used. 
or you'll get lost tracking off a random white bunny from an alternate universe for three books. That's why there I, is that. I, I plant landmines and I make note of where they are and <laughs> we just walk right past them. And some of those landmines are going to stay there for a few centuries or a few years or whatever. And then somebody will step on it when I need it. It will be there. Yeah. Somebody will step on it. So, yeah, I, I, I get where you're going. And, that, and that's kind of the thing. There are some people who aren't going to catch the, as, as much foreshadowing as you may put in there. They're still not going to find it. So, and there are some people who, uh, there was one, off, one other, other author, actually, I was arguing about over um, dramatic irony. And they were like, I don't understand. This character is so obviously evil. Why? Blah, 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 blah. Yes, you as the reader have all the information and should be able to establish the instant this person shows up on screen that they are almost certainly a bad guy. The men know I mean, the other characters know it. None of the characters know this. You as the reader, you know this. You, under, you realize that an assassin has just been inserted into the entourage. There's no one, no one in the inside of the book has enough information to put that together. It's Othello. It's dramatic irony. You as the reader know something the characters don't. Again, that's something that people, uh, some people seem to find quite bothering, bothersome. It's weird. That didn't yeah. used to be such a big problem, but it seems, it seems like it's become more of a problem. Yeah, people seem to, the, if the reader can put together something, a lot of people feel like, it, well, the, read, the character is so stupid for not playing it together. I mean, realize that you, as the reader, almost certainly have more information than the character does. Unless I'm writing a single person, deep point of view, because uh, I never, I almost never write in first person. So, but I can't. I have, I do occasionally uh, do third person, close point, deep point of view, which is actually what Peacekeepers, uh, or at least Raven's Peace, has written in so far. It's quite restricted to one person's point of view. But unless I'm writing in one person's point of view, you almost certainly have more information than an individual character on, on the page. You should be realizing things that the characters aren't putting together. Yeah. And sometimes you absolutely have to do that because there's no way for the characters to know. You need the you need them to know, but the, you don't need the characters to know. But you be you as the reader, and it, you as the reader are more separate from the situation, and therefore you can you know work through some of the intellectual conclusions that the people in the book might not necessarily because they're not prepared to realize that someone might do something that fucking horrible. To use the Sword of Mars example. Where, to a certain extent, the characters have enough information about halfway through the book to work out what's going on, or at least to have a pretty good idea, but it does not occur to them because it is so far outside the pale of what these relatively moral, ethical people would even consider. Given that one of the relatively moral, moral ethical people is a former assassin, <laughs> what could go wrong? <laughs> That's always the watchword around here. Apparently, more terrible than you think they are. You know it, that I've never written a particular story where something you said there just it keeps coming back to me. I want to write a story one day where the protagonist is a bad guy, where he is the evil in the story, and something much much worse comes along. And he finds himself having to fight for the, the survival of humanity, knowing that he's the bad guy. Now, I, the irony of having to do that. Yeah. Evil versus evil. What's worse, the, uh, the person who wants to conquer everybody or the person who wants to kill everybody? Exactly so. The one that wants to be in charge has to fight something that's going to exterminate humanity. And everybody on every side hates him. But there you are. And one of these days, I may actually write that story because it's a theme that appeals to me. Mm -hmm. and, I have uh, to bring all the scumbags, all the rebels, all those people together if we're going to have a shot at this. Call up the secret police. I have a new mission for them. <laughs> <laughs> Their job is to find all these kids that have played the last Starfighter video game. <laughs> Are you sure it's not like Star? It's not like uh, Jay and Silent Bob, where they just find everybody that you know, <laughs> slammed their movie and go to their house and curb stomp them. What? What would that? What? How would that do any good against the alien menace that's coming? What? What purpose would that serve? It would be fun to watch. Okay. <laughs> this is why we don't let Terry out of the home very often. Mm. <laughs> you about it? <laughs> Glenn's like, oh, that explains it. 
I've seen Terry in public. He doesn't do too badly. I'm socialized mostly. Better socialized than me some days, I mean. I mean, that's a pretty low bar to clear. Especially right now when I haven't left my house in eight weeks. <laughs> <laughs> Just be glad you you know. When you get to the day to where you start going out of your house, you know, I, I think I'll go pick up something. You discover that you're in a bathrobe with slippers and your hair is, well, you don't have any hair, but if you had hair, it would be sticking out to here. I usually have hair. I shaved off everything because I got so frustrated uh, trying to keep things in order while I like, could barely stand. Yeah, yeah I, I saw the picture of you where you had done that, and I was like, he's from France. From France? Uh, maybe that joke is a little old. The whole... Uh, <laughs> The whole aliens with the egghead. We're from France. Ah, conehead. Coneheads. Coneheads. Right? Are you trying to say he's a conehead? I thought that immediately when that when I saw his picture that he was a conehead. <sighs> Terry, you're just not a very nice man. I know, right? You're just not a very nice man. You have all these horrible thoughts about people. What is wrong? Like, with you? like I'm pretty sure I've seen that movie, but I think I was like eight. <laughs> <laughs> I I actually saw the movie, but. I got it from the Saturday Night Live skits first. Yeah, same here. I'm I, of that age. <laughs> I only watched that on the on cable. I watched Coneheads on cable. <laughs> or on, on satellite, I think. In the no, I watched it on satellite in the United Kingdom, so I would have been about 12. Oh boy. Uh, it doesn't really make me feel all that much younger. So, uh, yeah, you, you can I shut up now. On here with, with Tear, it's original color. I think mm, it's yeah. <laughs> right. You're the voice of youth on this show, Paul. That should terrify the crap out of everybody. <laughs> wow. Who's the oh, voice? gee. I'm Junior among the Methuselah. Oh, thanks. <laughs> That's why you keep calling me Grandpa Simpson. Usually <laughs> well, Terry, I think we should probably wrap this up, man. I think we probably should. You've got a new release, though, that just came out. You should go ahead and pimp it up. Uh, we just launched Refuge, which is the second book, which is the sequel to Exile, which my team has been calling the second book of the Exile trilogy because I forgot to tell them not to. Oops. <laughs> uh, the... Quick blurt, what was, I'm trying to remember what the, the one sentence liner I had on Twitter for it was. All right. Uh, when you're 70, when humanity is 70,000 light years from home, how much of that prepared to sacrifice to save somebody else's planet? So, in the middle of a genocidal terraforming campaign, humanity has to decide whether they can spare the resources to save some, someone else from a bunch of, from a bunch of, you know, genocidal robots. And then things get complicated. Oh, then things get complicated. Oh, yeah. Got you. That's Got the simple you. part. It's true. That is actually the simple part. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, can we find you on the web? You got a website? Uh, website is glenstuart.com. If you can. Short, simple, easy, perfect. Yep. If you can spell my first name, you can generally find me on, on the ebook stores. G L Y N. Terry has never pronounced my name right in two years now, I don't think. I don't know that I ever have. How do you pronounce it? Glyn. Glyn? I yeah. can't. I'm not sure that I am. I'm an American. I'm not sure that I can actually pronounce it. <laughs> it's Glyn instead of Glenn. Yeah. Glyn, Glenn, Glenn, is, Glenn is something completely different. Glenn. I live with someone who lives in a Glen. A Glen is a small valley. Yeah, as I opposed will, to living in a Glen, which would make him very uncomfortable. I will try to remember that, but I have no guarantees that I will not horribly <laughs> mangle your name going forward. Okay, I've told you, I, I have harassed you for it before, and you're still getting it wrong. So. It's the Texan. It's the Texan. It makes it very, very difficult because we hear all those words the same. Yeehaw. Yeehaw, yeehaw. Yeah, what, what Terry just said. Well, folks, you should go out and you should check him out now because the series is excellent. In fact, all of his books are excellent. So you need to go buy them all if you haven't got them right now. That's just the way it is. <laughs> Thanks again for coming on. We appreciate you joining us today. It's a pleasure. It, gets, it doesn't quite get me out of the house, but you know, it distracts me for a bit from the fact that I can't leave. <laughs> <laughs> you had the human today. Well, Hopefully you can arrange escape later, you know, maybe get a team to come in from the outside to spring you. I can leave whenever I can walk. 
Oh, yeah, that's true. As yeah. long as I can walk, I can leave. I can't walk right now. Well, folks, if you would like to send us a note and talk about series or Glenn or any Glenn, Glenn, there we go. I will try. Send us a note at show at deadrobotsociety.com. You can find us on Twitter. By us, I mean Paul at Paul underscore E underscore Cooley. You can find us on Facebook at the listeners of the Dead Robot Society Facebook group. We have to thank the good folks at podhoster.com for hosting the audio. You can find us on YouTube at youtube.com slash DRS podcast for the video version. And of course, if you would like to support the show as a patron, you can find us on patreon.com slash DRS podcast, where for as little as a dollar a month, you can get exclusive content like live shows and listening into all the pre-show madness that we do. And if you're a $10 supporter, you get your name read on the air like Paul is about to do. And our $10 patrons are Andrew Smallwood, J.D. Barker, Aaron Meiser, Jesse Elf- Elefino Orcutt, Veronica Jiguer, Can't Pants, Won't Pants, Outlines are Cozy. Well, okay then. Kelson the Tutor who tutored the flute, Isabel Cushy, Rick Shaw, Lisa Slacks, Lisa Slack, Nathan Cosby, Cheryl Winters, Tracy Bodine, Devin Lee, Drew Suttle as a hand grenade, Dope Mill Bernardi, Chris Winder, Andre Conde Marais, and J.R. Hanley. Thank you very much, folks. Thank you, Thank you for to all of our show. patrons. Exactly so. Thank you to all of our listeners and viewers. We appreciate you. And with that, we are out of here. Say goodbye, everybody. Yeah.